evening. What a joy and what a privilege it is to be right here in the Apollo Theater. <laughs> to be in a place where for 85 years the arts, the music, the literary expressions of black life and culture have been presented. And how appropriate it is that tonight, as I shortly welcome to this stage a true shero. I mean, when you're out in the cold taking selfies <laughs> on the 125th Street, we were making the amount of bottles a little bit ago, you'd be a shero. <laughs> But how appropriate it is that my sorority, in collaboration with WOW, is presenting this program tonight during Women's History, better put, her story month. Now, at last, as Ella James would say, <laughs> At last, I come to just a few words of introduction of our special, special sister, the inimitable Nikki Giovanni. Right. Widely known and respected as one of America's foremost poets, I want you to hear this. Nikki began in a way that many of our sisters still begin as they dream of being a poet. She self-published her first volume, Black Feeling, Black Talk. And she did that in 1968. Fast forward to her New York Times bestseller, Bicycles. Love Poems, published in 2009. Our sister Nikki has also published several works of nonfiction and children's literature. And she's made multiple recordings. Sora Giovanni is a frequent lecturer and reader. She's taught at Rutgers University, at Ohio State University, and Virginia Tech, where she now serves as a university distinguished mm -hmm. professor. Yeah. And so very shortly, we're gonna welcome in conversation with me, our beloved sister, poet, teacher, my Sora Nikki Giovanni. And you know, before I do that, Let's see if there might be another way to get you ready to welcome <laughs> Nikki Giovanni. I was born in the Congo. I walked to the Fertile Crescent and built the Sphinx. I designed a pyramid so tough that a star that only glows every 100 years falls into the center, giving divine, perfect life. and burned out the Sahara Desert with a packet of goat's meat and a change of clothes. I crossed it in two hours. I am a gazelle, so swift, so swift, you can't catch me. For a birthday present when he was three, I gave my son, Hannibal, an elephant. He gave me Rome for Mother's Day. My strength flows ever on. My son Noah built a new ark, and I stood proudly at the helm as we sailed on a soft summer day. I turned myself into myself and was Jesus. Men and told my loving name. All praises, all praises. I am the one who would say. I sold diamonds in my backyard. My vowels delivered uranium. The filings from my fingernails are semi-precious. 
to see the people who wanted to come and be with us. My, my good brother, Gene Peters, is here with his people. Yeah, absolutely. And I had the uh, great fortune uh, to have a son. I, I think if I had a daughter again, I probably would have a daughter, but I didn't. But you got a granddaughter. I got it. He, he gave me a granddaughter, so he did the right thing. So Thomas and Kai and his good friend Tracy are here with me tonight, and I'm so incredibly pleased to have my family here. And if, uh, if, if, I, if I had to have a backbone, and I, I, I think I do, I, I couldn't have it without Jenny Fowler. Jenny's sitting right here in front, so I think I'm very, very fortunate to have all of my people with me tonight. Now I'll tell you who else is here. Here in the Apollo Theater are card-carrying members <laughs> of the Nikki Giovanni Fan Club. However, I want to make it perfectly clear. I carry the title of chair of the board, president, and chief executive officer of the Nikki Giovanni Fan Club. So, thank you. You've got to feel all of this love. And this isn't the first night you felt it. But have you always somehow felt so embraced, so appreciated? Or has this been a journey for you? Golly, you know, let me share this one other thing. In my office, is this loud to you all? Because it's loud to me. No. <laughs> In, in my office, there's a when when you became president of Spelman, yes, yes. there's a. Well, that's just because you couldn't get in fist. It's on my wall. When I walk in my office, you're you're right there. So it's a, uh, it, 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 you are so meaningful to us. But you know, I'm I'm, I'm uh, this is not answering your question because I almost never answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I am I'm, I'm I'm proud of the educators, and I'm proud of the people who have done things. I'm I'm proud that I finally graduated from college. But, <laughs> I'm really proud, and, and that's what I'm working on, Johnetta. I'm really proud of the people who stayed, because it's easy to forget the people who stayed. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, we were talking, someone mentioned lynching. It's easy to forget that somebody cut those bodies down, with, oh, which was bad enough. But then you had to wipe the spit off. 
and then you had to close up the wounds that were open by by. And they did that, and then they had to bury them. And they had to carry that story forward. And they carried that story forward with the spirituals. That we, we ask ourselves, because we're looking at, you know, a, a Donald Trump, we're looking at a Nazi right now. <laughs> How are we going to get through this? And you and I were just sharing it, but we're going to get through because we lean on the everlasting arms. Yes. 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 Safe and secure from all along. Yes. Leaning. Leaning. Yes. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Yes. And those spirituals, I, I was watching the fires in California and I was loving it because I'm not a nice person. <laughs> And you know, all of the big fires in California, and I was saying, God, it's gonna set this world on fire. I was just loving it. <laughs> That's the truth. And you know, you, you, you just wonder, you wonder three hundred years ago, what our ancestors. And I love the way that we we are. Of course, our ancestors signified a lot. Said heaven, heaven. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going, going to heaven. heaven. <laughs> I, I just love what the story and how the story got told. And I know that, that, that we do that, we did it through the spirituals, we did it through the blues, but I just love going back to, this is the way these people talked each other. And that has to be respected. That just has to be respected. And I do, and, and I, I, I shouldn't tease Thomas, but I, I'm very fortunate I have a son and I was able to keep him. Because if, I, if he had been born 100 years before that, being a boy, they would have snatched him from me. They would have sold him. His song would have said, sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home. And so we have a way of saying, he didn't know, he wouldn't know what song his mother was singing. Yeah. You know, and that's what we have to think about. We, 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 I don't know if anybody in this room was adopted, but I know that giving up your child is not an easy thing. It's not something you do because you're crazy. It's something you do because you're hoping you can give your child a better life. And I think that as we look at the world, because if black people don't lead, nobody is. We don't the only ones that got sense. <laughs> begin to look at what does it take for us to make the sacrifices that we've made to help help our children go forward. Mm -hmm. And it's good to make money. I'm an American, you have to make money. But we know that money is not nobody in this room wants to wake up and be Donald Trump. <laughs> you just don't. You don't go, oh Lord, let me wake up and be white. <laughs> So loved and cherished. What I was really edging up on is that I know, Nikki, you don't just think of yourself as yourself. You think of yourself, and you sure write in a collective sense. You write for all of us. And clearly, we are now in 2016. But in sixteen nineteen, you and I, millions of our people, were not loved and cherished. And indeed, for me, when I think about the worst of enslavement, and I can, with so little effort, 
Think of the most horrific expressions of it. The rape, the snatching of children from their mother's breasts, the whippings. But the worst of all of that was the creation of the notion of white supremacy. Because without it, how could one human being have done to us what was done? So clearly, when we think of ourselves collectively, no, we have not always been loved and cherished by those who dare to sell us. But have we always loved ourselves? <laughs> Is that not the bigger question? Well, you know, Johnetta, one of the things we were just talking about, and I was, I, I don't get to do many shows very often, so the last show that I did, that was a, a show I, I did with Toni Morrison because Slade, uh, her son died, and I, I was talking to Maya, Maya was with us, and I said, what do we want to do for Tony? So we decided we wanted to bring the writers together. And we did a, a, a program called Sheer Good Fortune, mm -hmm. which was really, um, really, as, as Toni Morrison said, and I was so pleased that uh, if nothing else happened in her public life, this did it. Because writers came from every place to read a part of, mm -hmm. of, of the Toni Morrison that they love. And I, I think that what we keep trying, <laughs> English, Nikki, what, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, I, I, let me go back, let me, let me, okay. Let me just go back for a minute, I, I don't know what kind Take of time. time. Slavery was not invented by white people. So we have to start with that. And slavery was something that they joined. Yeah. Somebody sold us and somebody bought us, yeah. which gave us the opportunity to become what we are, which is a new people. And despite the fact that you do have people that want to hold us down, that want to make us feel bad, I always think of that 10th day, if any of you are historians in the room or your children are history majors, on that 10th day, on that ship coming to what was going to be, we say a new world, but it wasn't that new, it was different coming here, we were going to fight. Everybody on the slave ship knew that when, when you looked out and you didn't know where you were, there was going to be a fight. We were going to lose because we did. That some of us were thrown overboard, some of us were shot, some of us were hanged. But I always think of that woman, and that's what I wanted, I'm, I'm getting to in a bad sort of way. When they put us back down to hold us down, I always think that there was a woman. Now you know that there's no such thing as African language. There are languages. Of them. There are languages in Africa, but there's no such thing as Africa, as there's no such thing as European language. So we have this woman, who's probably my age at that point, old ladies, who didn't have any way to talk to the people who were now being put down and recognizing for whatever was back they've lost, if I'm making sense here. You are. So what she had to do was find a way to comfort. And what she said was, mm -hmm. and they took up on that ship, that moan. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna bring that moan to America. Mm -hmm. And when they come, it wasn't America then. Everybody's always talking about, you know, the Indians. There's no Indians, because Columbus was lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was lost, he wasn't in India, there were people living here. <laughs> And so when we start to talk about what, well, you know, we found that it wasn't lost. <laughs> he was lost. And so we, you know, the white folks who came are gonna kill the Indians like they're gonna change us. But being enslaved and not knowing a European language and to them being able to enslave us, they have to learn our language. So when we talk, when I'm sitting here talking to you, we're not speaking English because any one of you that have been to London any place, not to mention Bristol or someplace else, not to mention some country part of, of England, you know damn well that, that what, what you hear, you don't, you don't understand what they're talking about. You don't. I want to go to the loo. They go, what the hell is that? I have to shit. Oh. You know, 
Mr. Chairman, we're not speaking English. We speak American. And in speaking American, they had to learn us. They had to learn our language. We know that the food, and I, I say it all the time, and it's true, I would starve to death before I would eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. There is not a white man on earth that ever fried chicken. <laughs> My son is here and I don't want to embarrass him. But I, know, I know. but I know I wanted to send Thomas to private school because that's going to be another step. It couldn't have been fun going to Summit Country Day. There had to be somebody at some point that called him nigger or that said something nasty to him. But at least he wasn't crossing the bridge and in Selma and getting his head split open. And there are kids now that we have in private school that we have at Virginia Tech who are bitching, they don't like me. Well, they're not there to like you, damn it. We fought, no, we fought to get you there. You're not there to be liked, you're there to go to the And as this younger generation started to say we were disappointed or whatever it was, this is the price, we paid one price. Now you're not hanging from a tree, thank God. You're doing, you know, some other things are happening, but it's still gonna be hard. I have a granddaughter, and I want her life to be better. But everybody doesn't have enough sense to love Kai, and Kai has enough sense to know that she don't love everybody. So we have to work, am I making sense? You're making sense. You're you have to work sense. these things out, because everybody's not. It's gonna be hard. And so you, talk, you said white supremacy, there's nothing supreme about those people. Because were better, then you could run the race. You wouldn't have to cheat. <laughs> and so what we're always hoping, people like me, I daydream all the time. By the way, Kai, we're going, I, I, I am still in love with my worm. And uh, we're going, there's, a, there's there, there is right now, as you know, global warming. And there's a worm and its community that's coming out of the Arctic Circle. It's coming down. And it's going to be the next thing. Human beings are on our way out. We, we, maybe we'd have another couple of hundred years. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was less. But the next biggest predator is, is the, uh, in which they're really tasty. I had two today. Is the, uh, <laughs> is the uh, urchin, sea urchin. And the sea urchin, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to, how to, for lack of a better word, murder them because you have to kill them. You stick the, you, <laughs> you stick a, a needle in, and their insides fall out, and then you pick out the rest of them. Then you put a little tur a little lemon on it. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> but the only thing that's stronger than the sea urchin is the worm that's coming out of the Arctic Circle because it's the only thing that can go up into the sea urchin. So that's the next best thing that's coming. Kai has agreed to go with me. We're going to the Arctic Circle. How special. And, and I'm so, I am so excited to go. And uh, Jenny, of course, and, and my cousin, uh, Allison, we're all gonna go up to the Arctic Circle. I've gotten us up to 80 degrees, and I wanna go up to 90 degrees because I wanna stand on top of the world. And the one thing that I want us to remember to say to our children, to the next galaxy are us. Because we can, we're the only people that get along with, that understand what's going on. And somebody said to me once, because I was talking about space, I'm a space freak. Said, oh Nick, you know, you're going to space somebody in rape you. I said, oh, I can handle that. I'm, I'm, I'm an American. <laughs> We've been raped all the time. We've handled it. And more, whatever they put in us, we kept. And when it came out, we named it and we loved it. So we know whatever's in space, our children can go and they will. So at one point I'm going to have a great grandchild that's going to have two heads or something. <laughs> and unfortunately I'm not a nice person so I'm going to be sitting in hell looking up saying, see. <laughs> love to hear you talk about friendship. You know, when I was 
just sort of thinking about tonight and picked up one of your poems. It's a poem to someone named Joanne. But it made me want to ask you about the role of friendships in your life. I mean, I know that many of your dearest sister friends are up there in glory. I'm talking about, you know, Dr. Maya. And we're talking about Mari Evans. And I could go on. And then there's your brother friend, Jimmy Baldwin. Um, but say something about the role of friends in your life. Uh, you know, I'm not friendly. <laughs> okay, I asked the question. <laughs> You're the last person you would think. I'm, I'm, I'm not a friendly person. But you have friends. Uh, I'm fortunate that, you know, I'm, I'm polite, but I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I'm not friendly. But our good friend, Dottie Height, in Cincinnati, many, many, many years ago, there was a... I said that, and thank you, because I said that to some sorors, and I said, you know, Dottie Height, and they looked at me. And I said, you can't tell me you're going to be a Delta and you don't know. situation, uh, Cincinnati Reds were owned by a racist, and, uh, and she had made some really racist remarks, and the head of NCNW was encouraged by money, and that was sad, I mean, they, they had to fire her, but she had a dinner and had invited uh, the, the head of the Cincinnati Reds, because she was going to say it's all right, mm -hmm. and it wasn't all right. And she was a friend of my sister, so my sister said, you know, Nikki, will you speak? And I said, well, yeah, I, I don't know why they asked me, because they had to know that I wasn't going to be nice to her. And uh, Dottie was worried, because she's the head of National Council of Negro Women. And so Dottie said to her people, oh, my goodness, what should we do? Who should we send out there? And she said, well, who's, who's speaking at that dinner? And they said, Nikki Giovanni. And she said, oh. I'm going on to bed. I know Nikki take care of it. <laughs> it was one of the nicest things that I've ever, I mean, I, the faith she had that I wasn't going to let that crazy racist bitch say that. <laughs> <laughs> Just meant so much to me, and I, I've always loved that. So. And she knew that I've always admired my mother, those two friends. I have, I, I have a, a, a friend or so. I have maybe two friends that are, are close to me. I, I think really only one. <laughs> well, you just don't have, I, I, you all know that. You know you don't have a lot of friends. And I've been saying to, to the people that I know, I teach the kids, and I've been saying to them, you know, you need to put Facebook away. Because when you're picking up Facebook, and these people that you don't have know, telling you what a good time they're having, then why are they writing you? If they're having a good time, it's like, oh, I'm having great sex. Then where are you taking a picture? It doesn't really make sense. And so you're only going to have a friend or two. And I'm, I'm, I'm fond of Jesus. I think he's a good guy. And one of the, but one of the things we always have to remember, and I always just show it so that people can see it. But you know, when he was on the cross, when he got up there, I don't know, I still don't know why. I wish I had learned Greek. I know a little Latin. I still don't know why he was in the middle, but it was important. Whoever, God put him in the middle. And when he got up there, he knew that he was there to die. That's what he was there for. He had talked about that before. He had been out in the, in the forest. Everybody says, oh, Jesus loved everybody, but he didn't. Because 
<laughs> you remember you went into the temple and told those sons of bitches, get out of here, son of bitches. <laughs> you know, it was 40 days and 40 nights into the desert, and Satan came and said, I can solve your problem, and he said, get thee behind me. They say, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm sure that Jesus had a good language, he said, motherfucker. <laughs> some Negroes lately. And we know that, that they bought them. We know that a poor woman that stood there behind Senator Will. Somebody should have gone up. And they're so lucky I wasn't in Washington. Because I would have gone up. I would have done what you do to slaves. I would have opened them out to check her teeth out. She was just a slave standing there. That's all she was. And she should have known that. But I was just pointing out that Jesus was in the middle. And he was trying to be kind because he was God and they weren't. And he looked over to the man on the right, remember? And he tried to say something nice, like it's gonna be all right, you know, we're, and the man on the right was a fool. And he says to Jesus, you know, you say you're God, but you up here dying just like the rest of us, how, how, how. And what you like about Jesus, and what we learn, because we're Christians, is you don't waste your time with fools. <laughs> Jesus just like, oh, I ain't gonna be bothered, I got things to do. And he went to the man on the left, remember? And the man on his left said, I know, I believe that you are God, that you are Jesus, and I believe in you. And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in heaven. So we know that if we who are Christians, we know don't talk to the people on the right because they fool us. <laughs> John, the beloved disciple, were the only two people that were with him. We're talking about friends. Now, we know that when Jesus was standing on the water, he said, Simon, come here, I got something to tell you. Simon said, that's water. <laughs> and he said, yeah, it's water. Come here, I got something to tell you. So Simon had his ideas of what he wanted to do, but you couldn't call him a good friend. We know at the last supper, and I always liked it that Jesus drank wine. I was so glad he wouldn't have drunk <laughs> So at the last supper, he said, I know one of you people are going to trade. You know, you, you, you're going to be deceived. But whether they were friends or not, we know that the people that went with him, we know that when he lifted up that cross, a man he did not know recognized that the cross was heavy. And his name was Simon, and he was a Cyrenian. He was from Syria. And he went and helped Jesus lift that cross. I've always wished I knew what they talked about as they walked up to Calvary. I know that they had a story. Jesus talked a lot. I know that he had a story to tell. But I know this. Simon was a black man who helped carry the cross. And I know that we who are black in this room and we who are not, who have helped carry that cross, we too are the right people. We have done our job. We can't die. We can't always go up to, to Calvary. Yes but we can help carry the cross, and we've done that, and we will continue to do that, and we are doing the right thing. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna believe you. You're not friendly, but I have <laughs> Among your close sister friends was Dr. Maya Angelou. And I wanna just bring up now some of her words, Nikki. Because she said something about courage. And the reason I want to reference her words is because if somebody asked me to give only one word that would describe you, I would just have to say quite simply, you're one of the most courageous human beings I have ever known. What 
well, now I'm going to have to go to Mari Evans, because first I'm, I'm thinking of Dr. Meyer, who said courage is the most important of all of the virtues. Without it, you cannot practice any of the others. And the reason I see you as so courageous, now I'm coming to Mari Evans, a number of your friends, is she said so simply, speak truth to the people. If there is one thing you have always loved, <laughs> Nikki Giovanni, is to speak the truth. And for that, we're all grateful. Yes. So, uh, I honestly think that the most important word to me is duty. Duty over courage. Let's let's hear it. I just think there are things you there are things you have to do. There are things you should do, and there are things that by doing the right thing, I like to think. In other words, if I can do this without crying, if I had been in the crowd and Pontius Pilate, who was a coward, had said, "Who do you want?" I would have stood up for Jesus. And when they took Barabbas, I would like to think that I, like Simon, would have helped carry the cross. That would have been my duty. That's, I think duty is so important. And, and I have such a love of one woman I never met, never, she's in heaven now, Emmett Till's mother. Oh! When she said, I want the world to see what they did to my son. She wasn't doing, that wasn't courageous. That was her duty. She, she needed the world to see. And so that's what you, you like to think that when all, for lack of a better word, the shit hits the fan, you're still going to stand up and do the right thing. And our people have, the history of our people is a great history. And it's our duty to tell that story. Yeah. It's not, oh my goodness, it's difficult and I don't, it, it's, 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 it's a great duty. I, I don't, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not using the word very well. I tell you a guy, and I don't know him either, uh, uh, General uh, 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 Sullenberg, who was flying a plane. Mm, Sully. You know, yeah. And he was flying the plane, and it was his duty. It wasn't courage that made him land that plane. It was his duty. And when he landed that plane, he did something else that I, again, I just like to think that if I was there, I would do that. He walked back, that the plane was drowning, and he walked to the back to make sure nobody was there. And he walked back, and then he walked back again. He said, is there anyone here come for? I'd like to think that that was a duty, and it wasn't like, Oh my God, this is sad. It was like, this is who I am. How will I look at myself if I don't do that? You know, Nikki, because we're sitting on this particular stage at this moment, in this month, and with the wonderful support of WOW, I'm thinking that your words apply to any people. <laughs> to any race, gender, <coughs> sexual orientation, age, whatever. But there's something to me about women who do their duty. Even though most of our images of doing the dutiful, doing the courageous, I'm shifted again, is so often associated with men, but I want to tell you something. Women do the right thing. What I want to see is the kids like my, my granddaughter's age, or maybe even a little younger. I want to see human egg be able to be put out, uh, 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 hatched. I think that what we're doing, you know, we, we keep it inside. 
And it's, a, it, it, it's easier that way. But I, I think that it would be nice if human aid could be hatched. And then we could look at it and determine what was worth keeping. And <laughs> on earth, and I'm not against, you know, but the best father on earth is Father Penguin. And Father Penguin, you know, Mother Penguin lays the egg, and Father Penguin picks it up. You don't hear any shit from Father Penguin anymore. <laughs> he picks it up, and he keeps it warm, and he and his friends, right? If we could find a way to hatch our egg, to lay our egg, and then Father Human, could find a way to embrace it and do his duty, we'd all be happy. <laughs> and we might, pardon my heavy language, take care of patriarchy that way. So, Nikki. <laughs> the men are gonna get me for this one. I've been saying, no, you know, but there's another thing, and then I won't do any other crazy thing. But you know, <laughs> don't there, tell that story. there is not a woman in this room, or if there is, I don't, don't raise your hand. But there's not a woman in this room that ever fell in love with a man because of the size of his penis. And men ought to get over that. It's the men that are excited about the size of their penis. how deeply you love Delta Sigma Theta I just think it would be so special, particularly again because it is March, it is, I don't know why we think we could contain our accomplishments and finish saying what we need to say about gender equality in a month, but that's the way they do it. But I think it would be so moving, Nikki, if you would read the poem that you wrote on the 100th anniversary of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Incorporated. <laughs> 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 I have to look for, by the way, uh, and I, would, I meant to share this, uh, my good friend Joanne Gavin, who was a AKA, but we can't all be Delta. <laughs> Furious Flyer with Wynn Brooks. Oh. And they're having their anniversary in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to share it with, uh, with all of us here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're New Yorkers. But I wanted to make sure that you knew um, about, about uh, what they're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go. Joanne is, is a, a good friend. And uh, Thank I, you. I, that, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to share that. And I want to make sure that Jean gets a copy of that because okay. I know that Jean will come down. I don't know if I know. I have, I marked so many other things, and uh, it's in a, I think it's in another book, but, uh, uh, 
I know. I'm Has there. anybody got a book? Who's got a minute? I'm embarrassed. It's um, the last one, To Cry. It's in there. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed if I don't have it because I knew I was coming here with you all. But uh, <laughs> you know, one of the, I must mention, we haven't talked about, but one of our sorors, whom I love dearly, not that I don't love all of us, but um, Lily and Bimbo, you know, but Lily, Lily was, uh, was, for, was foresighted. And you know, Lil bought, uh, and I knew her, but, but Lil purchased, uh, we, we own a satellite. And a lot of Deltas don't know that we own a satellite. And nobody knows what we're gonna do with it. <laughs> I think it's one of the greatest things she did because space is an important part. And I mentioned that, and of course I mentioned Dottie because uh, there's just no way for me or anybody not to love Dottie because you talk about a courageous woman. You will see Dottie when you look at uh, uh, the March on Washington. You, you see Dottie is, is on the, on the, uh, on, on the, on the podium there. And I think that that's important. I think they should have let more women speak when you consider that we not only birthed them, we've been feeding them, we took care of them. And you know it's true. And um, I'm not gonna find it. I, um, they have it, they have it. I, I, I don't, I don't. Here's, here's what I call a teachable moment. <laughs> Somebody shot it? Yeah. Uh, uh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is a spell woman. <laughs> you know, for all of the writers in the room, the one thing that you must never do is remember your poetry. <laughs> and the reason that I'm saying that is that if you remember it, you'll keep yourself, you don't want to make a mistake. And if you want to be a writer, you have to make mistakes. And so the only way to do it is to be able to go forward. And so if you just forget what you used to write and then write it, and then somebody will say, well, 10 years ago, you said this and the other. Well, that's what 10 years ago you learned. If you don't change it, you got another, you got another problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm going through it, I'm going through it, I'm going through it. And, um, <laughs> and there's no this reason is for you to <laughs> use the table of contents. <laughs> And my uh, aunts were all Deltas. And in the old days, when you joined Delta Sigma Theta, in the old days, being my, my mother's uh, in a beta chapter, Knoxville, Tennessee, Knoxville. And you had to graduate from college before you could be taken over. We've changed that uh, since, and I'm glad. But the speaker of graduation that year at KC was going to be Mary McLeod. Bethune. And of course, Sora Bethune is our great Sora. And uh, they wanted her to be able to give the Deltas their, their special handshake. And so when, uh, when they, they took her over the day before, and so that when Mrs. Bethune, uh, Ms. Bethune spoke, uh, she was able, they were able to give her, excuse me, the, uh, the handshake. And my mother said it to me, and it's one of the reasons I learned to love Delta way before Delta was going to be bothered with somebody like me. <laughs> was, uh, she gave her the handshake and, and said, welcome little sister, good luck. Aww. And it was just so sweet. Let me, let me read a poem I do have. <laughs> It was my mother. It's called I Married My Mother, because I did. Oh, I, I did. Uh, my, my father was an idiot, and when he finally died, my mother and I, I, I didn't learn to drink in, until about 30 years ago when I moved to Virginia. And because Gus was an alcoholic, as my son here knows. And uh, Gus died, and uh, I was sitting there talking to my mommy drank beer, and, and Gus, uh, and I was drinking coffee, I drank coffee. And I said to her, you know, mommy, you should have married me. And she said, well, baby, if, if I had married you, how would I have gotten you? Which is what took my mind into, we have to find a way for humans. <laughs> 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 uh, 
lot of trouble, but I married my mother because things made me sad. And that's one reason I am not friendly. Things made me sad. A lot of things that I saw made me sad. And I learned way, way, way long ago. I don't cry. I, I, I'm learning. I learned at 74, I learned to cry. And learning to cry has been a, a great uh, relief. And for any of you who have high blood pressure, most likely if you learn to cry, you could do better because you're holding things in. I said that to my doctor. He doesn't believe me yet. And I said, I said no, I've given him, a, a, I've given him a, a, a gift. You need to be able to tell people, oh, you have the Nikki. And then you need to say, he doesn't understand that yet. But I married my mother. I know crying is a skill. I automatically wipe my eyes, even though I know crying is a skill. Maybe I will learn, my mother did, when she thought I was asleep. I think my sister did sleep, but sleep is as difficult to me as crying. I laugh easily, and I smile, and withhold any true feelings, except once I fell in love with my eighth grade teacher and spent most of my life trying to feel safe again. Though maybe I'm safe now, after almost 30 years, which is as long as I live with my mother. Maybe this is not a poem. Maybe it's something else. Maybe I just wanted to show my father that he needn't be cruel. Maybe I just enjoyed buying the house he had to live in, mm -hmm. showing her she should have married me instead of him. Or maybe, since we all soon will be gone, I should be happy I found my mother and someone else who loves me. What else really matters? So this is the new book, I'm working on a book. Uh, you know, I'm always going forward, so I'm excited about the, the new book, which tomorrow I'm going to be uh, working on. I, I think that, uh, and I get mad at black men like all sane black women do, but uh, I think they need a shout out. I think that black men are, are, are being, uh, truly, not I don't think that black men are being abused. And I wrote a poem, and it's like, yeah, this is a love poem. And I did it because, one, I hate Donald Trump. And we have to remember that it was Donald Trump who, who bought that ad, who bought a page in the New York Times that said, well, those men who didn't do anything should be executed. And we have to remember that. And I wanted to write a, 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 a celebration of the, of the a Million Man March. Because one of the things, you gotta now have courage. One of the things that the men who got up to go to that march, one of the things that they didn't know was would there anybody else be there? Mm. They could be the only man on that mall. Mm. And if they were on that mall, I wanted him to know, we are proud of you, yeah. that you have done the courageous mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I really love it. I'm, I'm trying to sell it. You know how you, those of you who are writers, you're trying to sell, now I'm trying to sell them. And everybody's saying, well, you know, I like it, but you need to take that rape scene out. And I'm saying, no, the rape scene has to stay in because one, 90% of the men who died were accused of rape, which is ridiculous. So if you ever go down to uh, Montgomery and you go into the lynching museum, you'll see rape, 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 rape. And then you'll see something that makes me angry, unknown, 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 because unknown is women. And you know, you can't accuse women of rape. And so I, I think either do it right or put it away until you're ready to do it. Because it makes me angry about that. And you get, you get sick of, of, of a Donald Trump who has said, I don't like immigrants, though he married three. <laughs> he, for the white women he screws, he writes checks for $130,000. We don't know what he's paid, because he doesn't probably pay anything for the black men, men and women that he screwed. <laughs> Now, now, that's not what you want. Sister <laughs> But thank you for loving it. The poem is really a lovely poem, by the way. Do you want to read the poem? <laughs> Somebody, let me, let, me, let me see if I can see without my glasses. It's pretty teeny. We marched. 100 years ago into a sisterhood, we came together in love and patience already called to assembly by our mother's sorority. We needed to, had to, must break out. The suffragettes did not want us, 
offering only the back of the marsh. Mm -hmm. Our other did not understand us, so we went our separate ways. Uh -huh. The time had come. Black women would no longer wait. We marched. We marched for the vote. We marched against lynching. We marched against bombing and burning. We marched for dimes, which the country took over without ever giving us credit for the idea. And let me just stop here because people don't realize that the first march of dimes was in Knoxville, Tennessee on Gay Street by Delta Sigma Theta. And when everybody saw what wonderful, they took, they did what, white people do, they took it over, and the next thing you knew, march it down, so it would be their idea. You get sick of that, but there was another, but you do get sick of that. We march for better, for better housing, for the pig project in Mississippi. We march for the first family, pro, pro, for the first family pro, prying project in Baton Rouge, which was burned down by bigots. We recognize you cannot be anti-abortion while supporting capital, uh, capital punishment. But what right must I birth him that you put him in the electric chair or in prison for life for a crime he did not commit? We, Sisters of Delta Sigma Theta, stood in the past. Dorothy Height was mentored by our great soror, Mary McLeod Bethune. Every president from FDR to LBJ had a Delta in his, his kitchen cabinet. Gene Nolan, famously boarded the New York train to put the power of DST with Daisy Bates and the Little Rock Nine. We stood for the future with Lillian Benbow to own a satellite in the sky, to be the first black Greek organization to make a film with dignified images of us on screen. When there was a need for a voice, our beloved Soror, Barbara Jordan, led the defense of the United States Constitution and therefore the impeachment of the president. We are a great uh, we are great. Our sister sorority remains strong and committed. We grow stronger on the love we share. We marched 100 years ago, and we will march 100 years from now, because we are Delta Sigma Theta. We stand for the good and the right. <laughs> To be here at the Apollo. You know, and I said, Well, Johnetta called. I said, How do you say no <laughs> to Johnetta? But I remember when Barbara Jordan, this is what I just want to share some, and then I, Barbara Jordan was running for office in Texas, and Jane Noble was president then. And Jane Noble called all of the Delsons, and I remember getting the call, and she said, You have to go to Texas. Said, okay. It was nothing else. And had, we all had to go to Houston to make sure that Barbara was elected. And of course, it was Barbara Jordan who led the defense of the Constitution, which everybody forgets. We, 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 we got rid of Nixon, but it was the defense of the Constitution. It was Barbara Jordan that did that. We have a few more minutes, but the time is right for me to present this to you. As you know, I now have this incredible honor of serving as the the chair of the board and the president of the National Council of the <laughs> This means that not a day passes that I do not think of the iconic Dr. Dorothy Irene Hunt. And not a day passes when I don't think of her mentor the amazing and grace-filled Dr. Mary McLeod with them. And so I wanted to present this to you because it is a memoir of a Delta that really works for the whole world, Dorothy Irene Height. It's called Open Wide the Freedom Gates, a memoir of Dorothy Height. Oh, Just a few more minutes. Is it time for us to do some Q&A or could I sneak in another one? I don't want to steal this book, by the way. <laughs> Q&A? Keep going. Oh, good, 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 good. So here's what I would be so grateful for us to spend a moment or two on. 
Now, Nikki, any human being, and I know you deal with a lot of extraterrestrial beings, <laughs> but, but, but any human, <laughs> whether this human has just been born or is thinking it's about time to go to glory, is aging. It's just that some of us are further on the journey, right? Like I'm way on the journey. You're not that much older than I am. <laughs> well, I'm 82. my husband, yeah. and he's here somewhere, James Davis State Jr., yeah. and it becomes clear that he's several years older than I, and I say, ooh, yes. his comment was, a man your age can't keep up with you, you better settle for me. <laughs> Back to the main story. <laughs> And it's fine. <laughs> what is this? What is this? What is this hang up about a process that is so natural? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I well, I laugh about it. It's not funny, but I do. I learned a long time ago. I have breast cancer. And I laugh about it because when I walked out on this stage, nobody said, what happened to her right breast? Nobody said, oh, her right tit's missing. <laughs> nobody can see that my left lung is. So when you said you're 82, I would be thrilled to be 82. And uh, if I don't be 82, as I said, I'm, I'm gonna go to, go to hell because I got a lot to talk to my father about my <laughs> You say I'm, my, my head is crazy, but see, another thing I want the next generation to learn, I'm probably the only person in America that wants to be fatter because I need to gain weight. I've gained two pounds last time. I gained two pounds. I'm so proud. <laughs> I'm really, I don't see why. Some of you in this audience are saying, oh, I'm too fat. You ought to be able to sell it. You ought to be able to say, I've got a, you know, five, going, five pounds on my right arm, you know. And I said, well, I need five pounds, you know, what you do? And, 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 and obviously, obviously, we're selling, you know, age. I think it's nice to grow old, you know, I really do. Uh, so, so I, I, I would be, I, I'll be happy to be 76, you see, and I'll be happy if I'm, if I'm not, I will have done my duty. Oh. Now there's something else that's on my heart that I, that I want to bring up. You know, I've called the name of Spellman and my Spellman sisters know about that place in my heart that they own. But I got a big heart. And then it comes. And you and I know that Bennett is struggling. And more than Bennett among our HBCUs. Nikki, you have been an amazingly righteous champion of our HBCUs. You are forever on the altar as a Fisk alumna. But you know, Fisk is going to have to change. You know, we at Fisk, and this will be a long way, I'm not, but we at Fisk have a relationship with the, with the Queen of England, and we've not used it. We have a relationship because we are the Jubilee Singers, singers. because we went to, the Fisk Singers went to England. We have Prince Harry, who obviously likes colored women because he married them. <laughs> 
But when I was growing up, a drop of black blood made you color. And it's still the biracial now, or whatever it is. But Megan is colored. And we should have had a better relationship with Harry than we do. We should have had Harry down at, at Fisk. But we also know, Janetta, that things are going to change. And a part of integration, we all pay a price. I mentioned Tommy, but we all pay a price for integration. And so integration is not just that, oh, they let us in. We're going to have to give up some things. I would like to see Fisk University become a part of Vanderbilt, because Vandy's moving in on us anyway. And so the question is, how do we want Fisk to? Knoxville College is gone, and that's, that's sad because we need Knoxville College, and Knoxville College is a Presbyterian school. We should have made a relationship. We should have recognized that at some point or another, and it doesn't mean that blacks can't do it, it just means that at some point, something has to change. Am I making sense? Yeah. 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 Now, if we know, and I got upset, and, and I was one of the early people that said Bill Crosby's crazy, and people got mad at me when I said that. But, I was really upset when they gave that money back. Because oh, yeah. all money, if it's money in America, it's dirty. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's just hypocritical. Well, we're not going to take his money because he, you, then whose money are you taking? <laughs> and we have to get over some of these things to change some of these things. Then it is important. And I just uh, just had lunch recently with, um, um, <laughs> see my mind goes, no, uh, 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 Marveline, I saw Marveline Hughes, because she's an old yes. friend. And uh, yeah, and because uh, she's done a great job with, with holding Diller together with everything that she had to go through. So we want to see new schools, but again, and you, you're going to have to tell your children this, those of you, are, it's not fun and it's not easy, but your children are going to have to go to school with white kids because not the white kids aren't doing us a favor. We're doing them. We, we, didn't, we didn't come to Europe to get white people to come to Africa. They came to Africa to get black people to come here. So we, we're looking at, we know who needed whom. And we have to keep that in mind. It's just something you have to look in the mirror every day and say, I'm black. Well, James Brown, I'm black and I'm brown. You, you just have to remember who went to get whom, for what reason. And our kids are going to struggle because there's still going to always be some crazy white kids there. But crazy white kids don't mean that you're not crazy. If you're a nigga, they're a cracker. So, uh, you, you, you don't have to be nice. And it, it upsets me, you know, when I, was look, I, when I look at the Democrats, it upsets me. Because they're like, well, when they go low, we go high. No, when they go low, we go lower. <laughs> They just gotta give it some time. Now, in doing so, we're not asking to turn this into a Baptist church. <laughs> we just need the question. <laughs> and to help us do this, I am gonna call on a Sora. Granted, she was born at a different time and of a different mother. <laughs> but we are as close as if we came from the same womb. It is with Gwendolyn Mason that I had just the pure D joy of serving as the co-chair of our sorority's National Commission on Arts and Letters. So, Twin, can you lead us it into some It would indeed be my pleasure, dear 
sister, Sarah, a twin, and thank you, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, this is opportunity because we designed this so that we all could sit at the feet of those that have come before so that we could learn from them. And part of that process is having an opportunity to ask questions. So we are going to answer as many questions as we can. We do have a limited amount of time, so please keep your questions extremely precise. I'm going to go ahead and get us kick-started with the event right question first that we have. And while I do that and pose that question, if those of you who have questions, you may proceed to the mics at this time. So Nikki, the very first question is, your interview with James Baldwin has resurfaced on yeah. social media. Yeah. What yeah. would you say to 28-year-old Nikki today? What's your fondest memory of that interview? My fondest memory, my son is sitting here. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta do it. Tommy was with me and Debbie, who's no longer with us. We were all, Jimmy had to come to London and because he needed breakfast and I was trying to be a good mother, we would get up in the morning and have breakfast. Well, Jimmy was a night owl, as you all know. So Jimmy would be coming in as we were having breakfast. And Tommy loved Jimmy, and Jimmy was very nice. And Tommy would say, Uncle Jimmy, Uncle Jimmy, take me for a walk. And Jimmy's probably hung over, which is a mile around. And Jimmy had to take Tommy. <laughs> Oh my goodness, just so remember, funny. if you have a question, you can come to the mic. So we're going to take another one from Eventbrite. Thank you. So this next question was, what was your writing process for ego tripping? Wow. And the poem for Aretha, and where were you when you created these pieces? Well, I didn't know Aretha when I wrote that. I would never have written that poem because it was so personal, like in, in terms of, it, it, I, 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 I was on the road myself and, and anybody who's on the road knows something about the road. And so I was watching her on the road with four kids and other responsibilities and I wanted to share that or I wanted to have that said. And so it was something that I understood after I got to know Aretha, I would never have written a poem like that because it's way too personal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't have done it. Uh, ego tripping was, I don't know, I, it was one of those, you wake up in the morning and you just go, damn, you know, I'm great. <laughs> I never had any idea that that poem would, would, would mean what it meant uh, to people. I really. Thank you, Jim. I really uh, had no idea. And I first read it in Boston. And uh, I, was, I was, whatever I was doing in Boston. And everybody responded, you know, you read a poem and you don't. And everybody's like, wow. And I thought, okay. And now, 50 years later, they're making that thing that you put glasses on. And it's like, you're the one, Kekai, who told me about you know, the And I saw the, the beginning of it. And they have the universe is coming out. And I couldn't believe that I did something that has lasted this long, that another generation has taken what they know how to do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled, of course. And, um, you know, again, I probably know ego tripping as well as any. The only poem I actually know, though, and I'm not going to, I'm not here to recite that, is County Cullen's Incident. Ah. It's the only poem I actually, I don't know, my own, I had to look up my poems, but I know incident, it's, it's one of the poems that I actually know, wow. so it's really, you know. Thank you for that writing, Nikki. It was riveting to I know many of our souls. So we're going to take a question from the floor. I'm going to start right here, and your question is? Hi, um, good evening. So in 2016, this is a very selfish question, in 2016, you spoke at um, Freedom School training at Alex Haley's farm, and you you inspired me to dive deeply into education. Here we are, a few years later. What would you say to encourage this generation of educators to keep influencing through education? Well, I, I, first of all, I, we are not uneducated. That's the first thing I said. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. If you just go back to your spirituals, we're not uneducated. And so the first thing that you have to remember is that we are not uneducated. 
so when we say education, what you're talking about now is schooling and, and degrees and you know other things that I, I guess are, are, are nice, mm -hmm. but we are an educated people because we have managed not just to come through it, but we've, we've been able to tell this tale. And we have a great respect, I think, for each other. Mm -hmm. If we are not careful, we will read the newspapers or we will look at, oh, God bless you, looking at Fox or something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all blacks do is, is rob and steal, but we know better than, than that. And so what we have to do is, is to recognize that we are educated. We're not dumb. And of all of the things in the Oxford English Dictionary, every now, every hundred years they add words, as you, as you know. And you know, there's only one word that they won't add. They've added every, you know, want to guess what it is? Ain't. Yeah. They won't put ain't in. And everybody uses ain't. And I've been fighting about raised and reared because I was reared. And everybody keeps saying, you know, we raise children. No, you raise cows. <laughs> you rear human beings. And so these are the kind of words that you, you, you fight. I fight about a lot of words like that. But you, you say educated. I'm not encouraging or not encouraging. If you are at a position, not you personally, because I don't know you and I can barely see you. <laughs> I can't, so it's not personal. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. But we're not uneducated. We're not. Blacks know things, and we have to keep going back. And that's why I love the spiritual. We, Johnetta and I were singing uh, just backstage the everlasting arms. How did we get here? Because we were leaning on the everlasting arms. How do, how do, how does. How do a lot of things, my grandmother's favorite song is It Is Well, and we sang that. <laughs> with my sang soul. That. With my soul. All of these things are meaningful. There's a story there. And I was talking about Jesus, because we forget that Jesus didn't have shit to say to that man on the right. <laughs> and we have to read. No, he didn't. Read your, don't, don't read that Bible that they're putting out there that they're selling you. Go back to reading your skull field. Go back to what King, King James was illiterate. He was. And so he sent his philosophers out and said, I want to know this story. Well, a part of the story said that fool on the right ain't got good sense. <laughs> and we have to remember some things like that. But you're saying, how do I encourage you? I'm not going to encourage you. If you fool around with people like me, you'll be discouraged. You'll drink and... and <laughs> going to do with your life is do the best you can with the people who you love and who love you. Twitter, there's certain thought leaders in that space. In politics, we have like women like Maxine Waters. You know, just black women who are constantly given the emotional labor of having to do right and fix things. How do we spread that? How do we get rid of that load, or should we not be getting rid of that load in terms of making things better all the time, fixing things all the time? She was asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great admiration, of course, for, not of course, but I have a great ad admiration for Maxine. But I'm sitting next to a lady who, as she is said, NCNW has done so much good work. Delta Sigma Theta, AKA Z Zeta Pi Beta, we've all done good work. One of the things that I think is missing right now is that we seem to be spending time trying to tell white people what they're doing wrong instead of trying to tell black people what we're doing right. <laughs> but I love Maxine, and it just makes me so happy when she says something and Donald Trump just gets so upset. <laughs> Thank you, my sister, right here. Hi. Uh -oh. All right. Um, my name is Jocelyn and this is Joy. 
I came here today because of the encouragement element from a black woman such as yourself for myself, but also to remember these things and share with joy. <laughs> My question is, our generation, I'm 31, our generation has a different responsibility or duty, as you said, you know, that really resonated with me, where people of your generation or my parents' generation, their fights were different. We tend to be a little bit more distant, but my main obligation is here, but I also, as an educator and as a writer, and just as a black woman, period, feel the need to contribute to other obligations as well. So my question to you is, what advice do you have, or even just words or comments to my generation and our duty? I think your generation is fine. I, I ran into the lady whose daughter started Black Lives Matter. I like your generation, and I, I, I think I've been really clear about that. And I think at 75 and a little bit older, <laughs> one of the things that we have to make sure that we're doing is not trying to tell you all what to do. That we're trying to say we support and, and believe in you and whatever you're doing to go, uh, to go forward. I'm a big fan of abortion, but I'm a big fan of single motherhood. So take it, I mean really, because none of my business what you do with whom. And I wish you good luck <laughs> with all of it, you know, and I hope you're happy and I hope that, that whatever got you to wherever you were, it, it, it works. But I think that, again, we're still trying to make you all think that there's something we should do for you or that you are not doing right for us. And I don't think that's the way it goes. It goes forward. And Nikki, I would like to add something to that. First of all, I want to say how special that you named your daughter Joy. <laughs> You know, if there's one process that I hope in all of our organizations we can cultivate, it's that which is intergenerational. Yeah. Yeah. So if we will stop with, what does this older generation have to say to the millennials? And are things all right with the millennials? If we can move forward together, then I think some of these incredibly pressing issues, the Delta Sigma Theta sorority and other sororities, that the National Council